When we find the integral, we want to find the area under the curve of f from our lower limit, which here we're calling a, up to our upper limit, which here we're calling b. So everywhere between this curve and the x-axis from a to b. Now before we realized that we could approximate this area by constructing rectangles of uniform width from a to b. Here I've constructed, you can count how many rectangles, but assume that you can't count. Let's call it n rectangles. Also, keep in mind that the width of each of these rectangles is uniform. Now again, I know it doesn't look like it. This one's a bit smaller than all the other ones. That's my bad. My apologies. That's human error. We're going to call this uniform width delta x because it's x2 minus x1, which is the same thing as x3 minus x2 or x4 minus x3. It's just the distance between each of these x values that define these rectangles. So, if we were to actually find the area of each of these rectangles, well, the first one, since we're using a left-hand Riemann sum here, look at the left-hand side, we're going to go from x sub 1, which is a, so we have f of x sub 1, which is the height of that rectangle, times the width of the rectangle, which is delta x. Our second rectangle has a height of f of x sub 2, and the width is, again, delta x. I'm going to do this all the way up through our final rectangle, which has a height of this one right here. Now, if the last one is x sub n, then the second to last one, the penultimate column, should be x sub n minus 1. It's 1 less than the nth. x sub n minus 1 times the width, which again is delta x. Now, I'm going to use algebra notation here to realize this as a sum from 1 through n minus 1. And from algebra 2, we know that we can represent a sum by capital sigma from n, we're going to call something i, from i equals 1 up through i equals n minus 1. And we're taking the sum of each of these function values. So what this means is we're taking f of x sub 1 plus f of x sub 2 plus f of x sub 3 all the way up through f of x sub n minus 1, since that's my upper limit right here, multiplied by delta x. So here is our algebraic notation for the sum of the areas of these rectangles assuming that we have n rectangles. However, this still isn't all that accurate because there's all this space in here, there's space right here, there's space right here, it goes over a little bit right over here, and this still isn't a perfect area under the curve. Well, how can we make it even more perfect? By adding more rectangles. So if we were to add more rectangles, we'll add another one in here, but there's still all this space over here. So we can add another rectangle right here. But there's still space. So we can add yet another rectangle on in here. And just as we saw with the derivative, take a look at what we're doing to each of our rectangles. We want to add more and more and more rectangles in here. Well, when are we going to get infinite accuracy? When we have an infinite number of rectangles. So imagine an infinite number of rectangles in here. What does that mean about n? Well, if we have an infinite number of rectangles, and if n is the number of rectangles that we have, or n minus 1, then that means that n minus 1, or n, is going to infinity. So how do we realize that in our notation? Well, we want to show that we are going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n minus 1 of f of x sub i times delta x. But that's not all. 
things get even cooler. This is really awesome. As a number of rectangles approaches infinity, what happens to the width of each of my rectangles? Well, consider this. If I were to double my rectangles, what would happen to the width of each rectangle? Well, it would decrease by a factor of two. We would have the width. What if we were to double that again? Well, we would have it again. How about doubling it again? You would have it again. What if you doubled it an infinite number of times? Well, that means that you would have to have it an infinite number of times. And if you have an infinite number of rectangles, what ends up happening is that delta x is going to approach zero. So let's write this out. As n approaches infinity, delta x approaches zero. Well, algebra doesn't really have a way of describing delta x approaching zero. I mean, when you found slope, you found delta y over delta x, the change in y over the change in x. And then when we took the derivative, we tried to find the slope at one instantaneous spot right here. And to do that, we had to find the change in y over the change in x as both of those approach zero, or the slope at one specific spot. And what we called that was dy over dx. The reason why we called it dy over dx is because that infinitesimal change in y, we call dy. And that infinitesimal change in x, we call dx. We know that dx is approaching zero. We know it can never actually be zero, but we'll let the limit approach zero. So as delta x approaches zero, in calculus notation, what we call that is dx. In other words, these little changes in x, the width of my rectangles, are so small that you would never be able to perceive it. It is a sliver. It is so infinitesimal that we don't even see it's there. We call that dx. That's what dx is. It's a sliver. It's an infinitesimal change in x. So this delta x here is going to become a dx. Now this f of x sub i, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to call that f of x. Now here's the cool part. The infinite limit, the infinite limit of the sum. We're taking the limit from 1 to infinity. That's an infinite sum that we're taking. We have a really cool way of notating that, and that's with the integral sign. So this whole limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from 1 to n minus 1, or really this sum from 1 to infinity, if you will, that's what this means. It's an infinite sum. That's way cool. And we're going from x equals a up to x equals b. So what does this notation actually mean? This notation means that we are taking the sum of an infinite number of objects from this number right here up to this number right here. So here is our A and here is our B and in between there are an infinite number of rectangles whose area we are summing. Now how do you find the area of a rectangle? Simple, by the height times the width. Well, the height of these rectangles are the function value at each of those infinitesimally small x values. And our width is now closing in on zero. It's approaching zero, and we call that dx. So lo and behold, we are taking the sum of an infinite number of rectangles whose area is height, f of x, times the base, dx. And that is what the integral notation means. It is the infinite sum of a whole bunch of rectangles with area f of x dx.